confirmation from a lot of people saying thank you uh, for the link being sent out, that the link got sent out successfully. Um, and I believe we would have the ability to start now. Feel free to uh, tweet the YouTube link live address uh, if you'd like um, onto Twitter or your social media platforms as well. Okay, so if I could get the presenters to unmute their microphones and Saima, feel free to get us started. Okay. All right, we're starting. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for Brown Complicity and White Supremacy Towards Solidarity for Black Lives. My name is Saima Chowdhury, and my co-moderator today is Zoltan Rana. We are both seconded instructors at the Faculty of Education at York University. Sultan and I are also the two new co-chairs for FESI, which is the Faculty of Education Summer Institute, a two-day annual equity conference that's offered by York University uh, through the Faculty of Education annually. Sultan and I are super excited, uh, in particular for today's talk, because we've been working with an amazing team to put, put together the content for FESI 2020. And this topic in particular, the concept of whiteness as it's embodied by racialized individuals, is one of the main themes that we wanted to cover. However, due to COVID, unfortunately, the majority of the content for FESI 2020 will be postponed to FESI 2021. Instead, we're going to be offering a modified five-part uh, webinar series. Um, and this is why we're super excited and grateful to these panelists today to take on this very important topic because it is critical and crucial during this time in particular. Uh, and thank you so much for allowing us to be co-learners within this space, panelists. Um, before we start officially, um, I would like to address the concept, the idea of hashtags. So we really did think long and hard about whether or not we we're going to be using hashtags for today's uh, learning. There's a certain performative piece in people tweeting and in thinking about tweeting as being vocal on social media as a form of social activism. And while social media is important to help raise the issues, it's important and we'd encourage all of you to think about a why or why not, the intentionality behind using it today. For some, it's a way of recording their thinking and causing ripples in social media spaces and amplifying different topics and voices. Some of you may choose not to use social media and instead <clears throat> will choose to participate silently and we honor that as well. We encourage people to take notes, to be present, and if you do share on social media platform, do so in ways that will further this conversation and perhaps share your own vulnerability and your reflective thoughts. Use social media. You may use hashtags such as hashtag brown complicity, hashtag brown fragility, hashtag brown privilege, or you may choose not to use a hashtag at all. For us, the value of hashtags would be, first of all, to further the conversations, and secondly, to be able to find it or share it later on, as we do hope that this will extend beyond this moment, such as hashtag Brown complete. The main thing that we're hoping for is that the learning will extend beyond today and it will transfer into transformative action. And with that said, I'm now gonna pass it on to Sultan Rana, who's going to take us through the land acknowledgement as well as set context for today's panel. Thank you. <clears throat> so, thank you, Saima. The indigenous peoples of this land were the, were the first land and water protectors. When colonizers came, indigenous peoples through treaties agreed to share the land. This talk is contextually taking place in the area known as Tikaranto, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. These treaties have not been upheld by our governments. Many of us are settlers to this land and Turtle Island. As settlers, not only should we be aware of our settler status, but be completely cognizant that the privileges we enjoy come at the expense of the indigenous people. Since colonization, education has been, a, has been weaponized as a tool to inflict and commit cultural genocide against indigenous peoples. 
By fully knowing, understanding, and grappling with this, educators must be aware of the professional duty we have to repair the damages done by education, to understand that schools are often conflicted and unsafe spaces for indigenous people. To work, to work towards better relationships and to do so in a good way, it is our moral, our ethical, and professional duty to uphold the truth and reconciliation, reconciliation calls to action. In particular, 62 and 63, which focus on how we can work towards reconciliation through education. We understand Indigenous people are not working towards equity, but rather self-determination and governance. And this is upheld by the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. We commit to doing better as a profession. Thank you. So on behalf of Saima and I, um, we are grateful for all of you to be here and who are joining us live and those who are watching asynchronously even after this um, discussion has occurred. Uh, I want to apologize for the late link sending. I just found out by circumstance that there's a 500 email limit per day for email account uh, via Gmail. So uh, I apologize for not meeting the time window that I had uh, indicated in your registration. So thank you for logging on um, and joining us today. And to let all of you know, we had a whopping 795 registrations and joining us live at this very moment, let me just see, are 357. So one could only imagine uh, once we tweet out or send out the recording of the session, how many more people will reach out to. So thank you for joining us. So without further ado, uh, we would like to introduce to you our panelists. Uh, first, Jiwon Chanaka, uh, is currently, let me get back to the slide actually that has everyone's picture. And when they speak, you'll see them on Zoom. Um, so first, without further ado, uh, we would like to introduce to our panelists, Jiwan Chanaka. Jiwan, say something so that your face comes onto Hi, the screen. Everyone. All Hi, right. Everyone. Jiwan is currently the CEO superintendent of a growing international American education network of schools based in Dubai and the former superintendent of school of equity, anti-racism, and anti-oppression for Canada's largest school board, the Toronto District School Board. Dr. Vidya Shah. Dr. Shah, say hi. Hello, everyone. Dr. Vidya Shah is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. And Dr. Harveen Singh, say hi. Hi. Dr. Harveen Singh is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Zayed University. So uh, allow me to pass it on to start, off, start us off with our learning today, um, Mr. Jiwan Chanaka. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having us. We're excited to be here today to start our, uh, or to continue our really important conversation. Let me start by saying that education systems have never actually served black or indigenous students well. The truth is as a system, we have failed black students um, in our structures, in our policies, our graduation achievement rates and our well in their well-being in a really and important outcome. Um, and what I think we need to acknowledge right at the front is that education as a system has failed black and indigenous students. For me to locate myself in this conversation, it's really important uh, for me to be able to say that um, and, and to complicate the notion of being brown. I myself am mixed, so I'm part black, brown, and indigenous. They're all parts of my identity. Um, and it, it just shows you the complexity of this notion of being brown. And so while I acknowledge the, the, the blackness that is a part of me, the truth is I have brown privilege. I pass, I get to pass as brown. Um, and there are things that I will never have to deal with that my, my friends, colleagues, people who are visibly black that they have to deal with. And so there are tensions that I'm constantly navigating in my own body, um, but regardless of what I know, I know personally and who I might be within my own identity as I understand it, I have to understand how people see me, how the world sees me, how they treat me. And in that way, I am read by my brownness. And so what that means for me in the context of this conversation is how do I navigate my privilege to be able to raise these issues and bring it forward? 
this conversation in the context of Ontario and in the context of you know Canada is long overdue, and it's it's a, a direct conversation not about what anti-blackness looks like because we have black experts and scholars who we can turn to, but what we're talking about is the ways that brownness is complicit in upholding white supremacy, the way we as brown folks uh, are able to benefit. Um, and, and, in, and in so doing, um, I have to acknowledge that today will only be the tip of the iceberg and that there will be a need for ongoing conversations beyond this. One of the things I wanna ask you to think about is how would you, because I, I, you know, the majority of uh, our attendees are within the Brown community, the majority, um, if, if this entire panel was black, I want you to think about that if this entire panel was black and naming brownness as a way that it upholds white supremacy, how would you feel? And if you're able to hear it better from us, why is that? That alone is something that I, I need you to think about because for a long time, black people have been saying and addressing this as an issue. And, and typically brown folks have responded from a place of brown fragility. Um, focusing again on their niceness, on their intentions, and using that brown privilege and often the proximity to whiteness to reinforce tropes of the angry black person, teacher, or parent, however we put it together, and then using those exact same tools of white supremacy to shut black people down. It really is a shame on us as a community um, or as a collective that we have not done this earlier. So to a large extent, I want to be able to say that in part, this conversation is, it is reactionary. It is reactionary to the time. There's been individuals along the way who've been doing the work in many different places, but collectively there's, there's a challenge. And it makes me really sad to see how many of us have been turning away or thinking that it's optional when we hear about the deaths of folks like Ahmed Arbery, Christian Cooper, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Tony McDade, I can keep going on. Or in Canada, you know, um, we can look at Regis Kuczynski Paquette, uh, DeAndre Campbell, um, you know, Abdi, Abdur Abdurrahman Abdi, uh, DeFonte Miller, ba um, Bonnie Jean Pierre, like the names, there's so many names. And if you don't know these names, it's really important for you to start tuning in because this is the reality that the Black community has been facing. Um, you know, recently, Tanya Talaga wrote an article and she said, you know, th that in the last two months alone, six Indigenous people um, have been killed by the police. And so, you know, on one hand, we definitely do not want to erase the very, the very distinct differences between anti-Indigenous racism and anti-Black racism, but they are interlocking. And so you will hear us at times referring to this through today. Um, at the same time, we need to have a separate conversation on what brown complicity in settler colonialism looks like and what the features of that is. And so hopefully today is a continuation. It will be, you know, the beginning of multiple conversations where we really hold ourselves to account for this um, and think about that. While we're having this conversation, I really want you to pay attention to what's happening to you physically. How are you feeling in your body? What are the thought processes that are going through your head? So, you know, if you're starting to say, well, that's not me, I don't do that, or I'm one of the good ones I've done, I want you to pay attention to that. I want you, when you feel that knot inside your stomach, what's making you feel uncomfortable? We absolutely acknowledge that there's been brown folks who've been doing a lot of this work for a long time, but as I've said, as a collective in Ontario and across Canada, we are lacking in our leadership to step up. And so one of the things that's painful and worrisome is it's great to see a lot of brown folks, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter. And that's really good to see from an awareness perspective. But the question that we need to grapple with is what does it look like beyond this moment? For many of us, linguistically, if you even go into your, where you, the, the root of your language is, to even be able to say Black Lives Matter from your language, and you look at how it's broken down, the notions of Black in many of the languages are derogatory. 
And if we can't, so if we even can't say it from that place, there's a lot of work from the place of discourse that we need to do with, within our communities and addressing how we benefit from brown pr privilege, right? Um, or um, acknowledging the fact that when, when brown folks do this work, how they are shunned largely by the black community and what that looks like, you know? Um, so when we think about what anti-blackness looks like in Ontario's education system, there's a lot of things that we, um, we need to think about. For example, what does, um, you know, how we have to acknowledge or start from the place of understanding that as brown folks, we have benefited, benefited from the labor of black folks doing anti-racist work. They have paved a path for us to be here. But then when it comes time for us to stand in solidarity, to be able to really be able to, to speak with and stand up uh, for black students, we shift towards whiteness and we leave black folks to do the bulk of the labor on their own. We know how it manifests, black children being sent out of class to the principal's office, higher rates of suspensions and expulsions, being streamlined or being expelled, being overrepresented in special education classes, underrepresented in gifted classes. We know all of this because of the labor and scholarship of black folks. And so we need to talk about as a, as a collective, what are we comfortable about with when we talk about you know, why are we more comfortable talking about anti-racism versus anti-blackness or anti-black racism? How we utilize our aspirations towards whiteness to perform whiteness. So we set ourselves apart from the black community by trying to appear to be more professional, fill in the ideas of being model citizens and hard workers. Um, and we either participate in white supremacy by perpetuating the same outcomes I just, uh, I just um, talked about. Um, we're silent about it and we don't actually actively address it oftentimes. So we may lower our expectations of black, of black students. We might participate in, the, in this talk that happens in staff rooms about the angry black children or notions of, you know, that, that kid's like a drug dealer, those kinds of conversations, or the angry black parent who's always yelling, those types of things. And so we need to think about how we allow ourselves in colonial systems to be used in the systems to keep pushing black children out. And that's the thing that I want for us to wrestle. Even when we think about brownness, in our minds, there's a construction about who's more brown. And often when you talk about brown folks, for example, from the Caribbean, there's a looking down of those brown folks because of their proximity to blackness, right? That's the notion of how it's constructed. And so what we want to do today is to start by acknowledging these tensions as they are. We're not going to be able to address all of them, but we're going to begin addressing some of them. And really, we want to keep asking ourselves, how are we complicit? with anti-blackness. So every part of you is going to want to switch to how systems push kids up. I want you to keep pulling yourself back to how are we participating in anti-blackness to the harm and detriment of black children. Um, and so on, on, uh, at, that, at this point, I want to pass it over to you, Vidya. Thank you, Jiwan. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We're so excited that you can be here today to be in conversation with us. Uh, for those of you that are on uh, YouTube Live and listening in on Zoom, welcome. Um, you know, we, we want to begin by saying that, as Juan was saying, this is a necessarily incomplete conversation. There are so many complexities and nuances in how we think about this. And so what we share with you today will be necessarily incomplete. And we hope that you engage with us to continue the dialogue, to keep the dialogue going, to keep the action going that accompanies the dialogue. And I want to also say that uh, Hervine and I, um, as academics, acknowledge that we have a certain kind of positional power uh, that uh, we didn't necessarily have in other capacities. And so we come to you today, not as experts in this work, um, but as people who have been grappling with this for a long time, and as people who will continue grappling with these challenges and complexities and nuances uh, for all time to come for us. You know, we say this um, 
in our conversations as we were, we were putting this webinar together, the three of us are, are so clear uh, about the fact that we have benefited directly from brown privilege and that we are inevitably complicit in white supremacy and anti-blackness. And so we wanna say that right off the front. We acknowledge that there are, as Yuan was saying, brown folks that have been doing this work for a long time as individuals and school boards and grassroots movements and the academy. And that many more of us are coming on board now as a collective to think about what this might look like globally. And we're seeing movements happening globally, which is so, so exciting. And we wanna just position ourselves in this discussion and position you as um, listeners in this discussion. If you are a black person attending this webinar, we welcome you and we thank you for taking the time to join with us in conversation today. As Jiwon was saying earlier, uh, we have not done this as a collective of brown folks, especially in Ontario and Canada. And we wanna just say again, I wanna say again that we are truly sorry for that. Um, it has taken us way too long to get here. And we understand and expect that there's gonna be a significant amount of mistrust. We understand that uh, as a collective of brown folks, we have been silent and complicit for far too long. And there's simply just no excuse for that. We need to do better because it is the right thing to do. And we need to be held accountable to demonstrate that we are worthy of your trust. We also wanna be really clear that we are not here as authorities on anti-blackness, that we come to you today as people speaking about brown complicity and the way that brown complicity thwarts equitable outcomes and opportunities for Black students. If you are an Indigenous person joining us today, we thank you for being here. And as we said earlier, we need an entirely separate webinar focused specifically on brown complicity and settler colonialism. If you are a white person attending the event today, we welcome you. And we wanna be very clear that this is not an opportunity to let yourself off the hook. It's not an opportunity to say, okay, so the spotlight's on the brown folks, I get to take a back seat. In fact, it's a way to further reflect on how white supremacy, white supremacy operates uh, that you benefit from, uh, the ways in which the mechanisms of white supremacy intentionally divide and conquer us, uh, pitting uh, black folks against brown folks, against indigenous folks, um, and the fact that it's an opportunity for all of us to think about whiteness that you are deeply steeped in is operating in all of our bodies as well, albeit differently. If you are a non-Black uh, or non-Black person of color attending today, we want you to think about how many of the features of what we share today show up for you um, in your own personal lives and in your community contexts, um, as there are gonna be many parallels that we'll see. But today's webinar is specifically speaking to Brown folks. So Brown folks on the call, welcome. We wanna say that you know while we cannot understand the impact of anti-Black racism directly, that we do understand the oppression that we may face based on our own melanin. Today's conversation is not gonna be about our experiences of racism. We are not gonna share all sides of the stories and we're not gonna share with you the great things that brown folks are doing to support black folks in this time. That's not what today's about. Today's conversation is explicitly about our complicity in upholding white supremacy and maintaining anti-blackness. And so some brown folks are gonna hear what we're saying today and experience us as race traitors. Uh, and we wanna be really clear that we're quite okay with that because if our definition of our racial identity as brown folks is wrapped up in the maintenance of anti-black racism, then we are happy to let that go. And we encourage all of us to be in a place where we're gonna divest from our uh, benefits uh, from a white supremacist system. And so we encourage you to join us today if uh, you are like us wanting to heal the anti-blackness that is so rampant in, black, in, in, in brown communities, then we must address this head on. And we know that we cannot have a love or a justice without truth. And so today's session is about naming some hard truths. So with that, I turn it over to you, Herbie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vidya. So what do we mean by brown and why do we insist on using the term brown and not South Asian? We're cognizant of the fact that brown people in the US often refer to the Latinx community. However, for the purpose of our discussion today, when we say brown, we're referring to the entire South Asian diaspora, including those who are descendants from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, the Maldives, the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Mauritius, Fiji, East Africa, South Africa, Europe, and so forth. The brown diaspora is spread around the globe. We recognize that many Indo-Caribbeans and brown people from Africa 
do not define themselves as South Asian. And many more who are born in North America, second, third, and fourth generation, do not identify as South Asian. For all of these reasons, and to capture the complexity of our experiences, we have decided to use the term brown. So when we speak of brown, we're referring to the subcontinent and the resulting diaspora. We recognize that these are contested grounds also in terms of how we are read by others and how we have to identify ourselves on census forms and other documents. We also recognize that there are many divisions among people that identify as brown. Some of these divisions within our community include Islamophobia, patriarchy, ableism, citizenship status as immigrants, refugees, undocumented persons, and heteronormativity, the othering of queer identities, gendered expectations, sexism, and so forth. These are important discussions for us to have. But today we focus on how anti-Blackness permeates within the Brown community and how we are complicit in white supremacy. We can look at casteism as it plays out today and its connection to shadism. Now, casteism today ranks communities based on their caste, with the upper caste being labeled as pure and the lower caste being labeled as impure. Also mapping onto this is shadism. Lighter skin is seen as a social marker of affluence and beauty, while darker skin is seen as impoverished and ugly. Within the subcontinent, casteism and shadism continues to have significant implications with regards to economic status, access to education, and overall lack of or access to prosperity. It is important to note that there have been movements within the subcontinent to disrupt anti-Black racism. However, it continues to endure. When brown people come to Canada as settlers, the ideas of casteism and shadism come with us. And it's not a far stretch to see how these ideas of casteism and shadism have been projected onto Black communities. As brown people, there are many of us who continue to experience racism. We recognize that. It is difficult growing up in Canada and the US and really any Western nation where we're often rendered invisible in the media, textbooks, institutions, and so forth. It is difficult being caught in between worlds, leaving our home countries and trying to figure out how to navigate and negotiate our multiple realities. As brown people, we recognize the complexity of our histories, of our lived realities and recognize that we experience oppression and specifically racism in many ways. However, what is absolutely perplexing and frustrating is that despite our own experiences of oppression and specifically racism, anti-blackness is rampant in brown communities. So what does anti-Blackness look like in brown communities? Well, it operates in a myriad of ways, from smearing bleaching creams onto our skin in efforts to rub out our brown pigmentation, to whom we should be friends with growing up, aka not Black people, to whom we are allowed to date and marry, aka not Black people. Whether this is implicitly or explicitly stated, we know the negative ways in which Black friends and a Black partner is viewed within our community. Anti-Blackness exists in our decisions and where we choose to live, seeing white neighborhoods as good neighborhoods that are deemed safe and respectable places. Anti-Blackness also exists in the way in which we justify the incomprehensible state-sanctioned violence against Black people as inevitable, blaming it on black culture, a culture of criminality and saying things like, what's wrong with them? Black people don't follow the rules and laws and that's why the police and other authorities respond with violence. This is absolute nonsense. In rationalizing the trauma inflicted upon black communities, we brown people are complicit in white supremacy. And allowing comments to be made in our presence and making comments that associate blackness with deviance, criminality, hypersexuality, aggression, uncivilized, loud, ignorant, unintelligent. We reduce black identity to culture. Uh, we re re sorry, pardon me. We reduce black identity and culture to food, sports, music, and crime. Anti-blackness is operationalized within our communities <clears throat> when brown people use the N-word freely. 
without understanding the gravity of the word, the history, the discourse, or the trauma it activates for Black people. When we specifically look at language, as Jeevan was, had noted earlier, we see that anti-Blackness is deeply coded into the words we use to refer to Black people and how it's often used in derogatory ways. These conversations, they happen in our homes, in our places of worship, in our workplaces, and most definitely within our minds. The reality is that brown people have reaped personal and financial benefits through the appropriation of black culture, including hip hop, black clothing, and black language. Brown people have made millions, and I don't know the numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't billions of dollars from the appropriation of black culture. However, when black communities are under siege, where are we? Where is collective brown solidarity for black lives? Till now, the silence has been absolutely deafening. It is important to note that anti-Blackness didn't materialize from thin air. Anti-Blackness is embedded within colonial design. It is based on securing economic and political power by inhumane means. Colonialism and the use of pseudoscience, specifically social Darwinism and the eugenics from the 1800s, pushed the idea of a racial hierarchy. And this racial hierarchy is still in operation today. The racial hierarchy firmly places whiteness at the top and blackness at the bottom with brown somewhere in the middle. This colonial design was used and it continues to be used as a device to divide and conquer non-white populations. It is from here that the model minority myth is rooted. The model minority myth is absolutely dangerous. It sounds like a nice term, model minority, but it's absolutely dangerous. It was constructed to uphold white supremacy and capitalism. The model minority myth is rendered, the model minority myth has rendered racism insignificant and has thus absolved us of our responsibility and the required actions needed to address anti-Black racism. For if brown settlers are able to thrive in this country, why can't the black and indigenous populations do the same? This sort of reasoning, it's seductive and it's directly associated with the belief in the model minority myth and is exemplified in statements like, I don't see race, I treat everyone the same. Essentially, the model minority myth was created to take attention away from the enslavement of Black people and replace it with, you're just not working hard enough. Not taking into account the hundreds of years of slavery and the eugenics project that firmly puts white people at the top of the hierarchy and gives them license to dehumanize Black people who are firmly at the bottom of this racial hierarchy. In this way, the model minority myth is reliant on the construction of anti-Blackness, which puts the brown community in direct conflict with the liberation of Black communities. While the model minority myth intentionally keeps us in conflict with Black community, the truth is that brown liberation is contingent on Black emancipation. We owe our right to be here in Canada to Black intellectuals, Black activists, and Black communities. Our legal right to be in Canada is based on the Ontario Racial Discrimination Act, the Ontario Human Rights Code, the Employment Equity Act, and the changes to immigration which occurred in the 60s and 70s, to name a few. I don't have the time to go into all the details. However, there is a long history and legacy of Black activism that has paved the way for Brown communities to be in Canada. These remarkable moments in history was a result of the Black Civil Rights Movement and the continue, continued efforts of Black activists. Simply put, Black Canadians have paved our way to be here, yet they are still being prosecuted by anti-Blackness and the model minority myth that puts them at the bottom of a false racial hierarchy. And we as brown people have been reaping the benefits of this racial hierarchy by simultaneously upholding white supremacy and anti-Blackness. Collectively, like Vidya and Jiwen had stated earlier, brown people have done little to disrupt notions of the model minority myth or support the emancipation of black communities. So how does the model minority myth harm us as brown people? 
The model minority myth merges all brown cultures into one single identity that does not reflect our cultural, historical, and geopolitical differences. Ignoring these differences erases the various and complex struggles that we face academically, financially, socially, emotionally, politically, and so forth. As a result, we may not be receiving the support and resources that we actually need. Furthermore, brown people have confused the definition of success with aligning to whiteness and white power. Think about it, what is success? Is it just about the job titles, the promotion, and the salary increases? Brown people really think of the cost of this alignment to whiteness. The question is, what are we sacrificing for this alignment to white supremacy and white power? It is apparent that we have internalized whiteness and voluntarily we've been giving up our core assets, including our cultural ways of being, our spiritual ways of knowing, our languages, our ties to the homeland, and our collectivist ways of navigating the world. We keep volunteering, giving away our assets, giving them away and giving them away in order to align uh, to whiteness and white power. In this process, we're inflicting self-harm. We're not hurting anybody else. We're hurting ourselves, our very personal core of who we are. We are dehumanizing ourselves. And once we have dehumanized ourselves in this way, it becomes possible for us to dehumanize Black communities. It is from this process of self-destruction that we are then able to subjugate Black communities and render them less valuable. In this process of emptying ourselves of our core brown assets, we are filled with tremendous anxiety and insecurity. And it is due to this insecurity that we lack the integrity to dismantle anti-Blackness within ourselves, our communities and our workplaces. In performing to the model minority myth, which re requires us to uphold white supremacy at the same time as upholding anti-Blackness, we become morally and spiritually bankrupt. The slippery part of this whole thing is that we also benefit from the model minority myth. Brown communities have reaped benefits from performing according to the model minority myth for generations. It's not new. Core to this performance is constantly aspiring to whiteness. How can I be white? How can I continue to aim for that goal of truly being a part of the white community? This alignment has provided us with privilege, access to power, access to education, but most dangerously, it has permeated the social psyche of our nation to see brown people as hardworking, non-threatening, submissive, eager to please, and flexible in their stance, which means we're really ready to change with the winds of power to ensure our self-interests are kept intact. In constantly aspiring to whiteness, we make ourselves more palatable to a system that does not wish to dismantle the status quo. And in doing so, we are easier to hire and to be promoted through the ranks than a black person, especially when we've already internalized this whiteness. In this way, we become honorary whites, meaning that we are accepted in white spaces by white people upon the condition that we continue to be passive, compliant, and constantly striving for whiteness. For example, the operationalization of the model minority myth in the workplace happens by focusing on diversity and inclusion at the expense of anti-Blackness. In this way, brown people are perceived as checking the boxes for diversity and inclusion. Meanwhile, anti-Blackness is, is not substantively addressed and continues to permeate throughout the organization and, and society. However, the reality is that we are the perpetual outsider. Brown people have benefited from anti-Black racism, which has kept us from being at the bottom of the hierarchy. However, in upholding anti-Black racism, we will never be equal to white people or black people. Essentially, white supremacy uses the false racial hierarchy to flip brown people at a whim. We are simultaneously held up as the model minority for black and indigenous people to aspire to, but we are quickly shut down if we talk too loud, too much, or campaign too hard on issues of equity. In this way, white supremacy flourishes and keeps both brown and black people firmly in place in this false hierarchy. So how does the model minority myth uphold white supremacy and anti-Blackness? Well, it continues to serve the white supremacist agenda of divide and conquer. It intentionally keeps racialized and minoritized people busy working in their silos, 
on issues of oppression. So we have the brown community resisting issues of oppression. We have the black community resisting issues of oppression. We have the indigenous community resisting issues of oppression and settler colonialism and so forth. As long as we are divided and working within our silos, there will be no coalition building and no uprise against white supremacy. Thus, investing in black liberation requires us to simultaneously work on issues of oppression within our communities, resist those issues of oppression within our communities, as well as number two, negate the model minority myth, and most importantly, um, coalition build with black and indigenous communities. So I'll pass it over to you now, Livia. Thank you, Herbeen. You know, I will, I will say that um, when we were talking about this talk today, uh, all three of us were uh, reflecting on the fact that we have come home to ourselves as South Asians and as humans really through the scholarship, through black scholarship, through the work of people like Bell Hooks and Andre Lord, through the words of Malcolm X, that we have come home to ourselves as South Asians. And we were able to explore and think about what it means to be South Asian and what it means to be human because we were first rehumanized through, through the words of black scholars. And we think about how true that is for so many brown folks um, and how dangerous that is because on the one hand, you know, we are using black scholarship to come home to ourselves. And on the other hand, how many of us are actually standing in real solidarity, putting ourselves on the line, taking risks that are necessary to actually um, claim spaces, a safe spaces for black folks. And so it becomes this form of theft. Uh, and I want us to just sit with that for a moment, this form of like ideological theft of, of you know, rehumanizing through other scholarship and then not doing the necessary work needed to stand in solidarity in real ways. Um, so we share that, we share that with you because we're going to spend the next little while thinking about contextualizing brown, com uh, brown complicity specifically in the context of education. And we know that some of you on the call with us today are not educators. And we invite you into this conversation nonetheless, because this work, these ideas um, transcend sector. And so uh, we're going to spend some, some time right now and think about what this means. And again, as, as I said earlier, this is not about shaming or blaming brown folks. This is not about, um, you know, trying to create animosity or antagonism. This is about truth telling. And we can't actually do the work of disrupting anti-blackness in, in, in us, contextualizing brown without this truth telling. So Herveen, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna approach this um, in, in a couple of different ways. Herveen, in, in speaking about the model minority myth and the perpetual outsider and honorary whites, sort of laid the foundation for ideological pieces, right? This myth of meritocracy, myth of meritocracy the fact that you know, within, within racism, there aren't different forms of racism. So neutralizing racism. Uh, what I'm gonna speak to you about today is two other approaches. So the individual and interpersonal approach being one, and the institutional approach being another. And so at the individual and personal level, what does it mean for us as brown folks in education to be complicit in, um, in, in anti-blackness? So the first thing that uh, is really true, I think for a lot of us is that we often hear each other. Um, we, we don't call each other- Neutralizing out. racism. Oops. Uh, we, don't, we don't call each other out on anti-black racism. We hear it, we see it, and in some effort to stand in a fake solidarity with each other as brown people, we're choosing a version of solidarity that is inherently anti-black. And that maps onto this idea of the denial and erasure of the expertise, the intelligence, the experience of our experiences of our black colleagues within the workplace. So, you know, many of us may pay lip service and say, we're going to be, you know, we're, we're going to be the ones who are doing uh, this work in anti-black racism, and we're going to lead the way and lead the charge. And then we turn around in that same moment, and there are, you know, microaggressions directed towards our black colleagues, which we know have macro impacts. And we attack the, the we attack the credibility of our black colleagues, especially when we feel uh, threatened. And then when black people hold us accountable, rightly so, there's often this conversation around, well, you know, there's claims to racism. We don't feel safe here. We don't feel that, you know, you're being nice to us. And it not only perpetuates this idea of the angry black person or the angry black woman, 
uh, what it does is it, like similar to white women's tears, we have our brown fragility operating that, that operates in such a way that has professional and uh, personal and, and political impacts uh, for, for black folks. And it's so easy then in a white supremacist system for people at the top of that system, white people at the top of that system to say, well, if you as a brown person are also experiencing what I'm experiencing, that that person's hurting my feelings, that that person is making me feel unsafe, then what that does is it further delegitimizes black experience, especially black experiences of trauma and harm. Then there's this notion of uh, demonizing black anger and black rage. And this is something that um, all three of us have spoken about and talked about time and again. It's this idea that, you know, what we really should be asking ourselves is, why are we, why are we not more angry? Why are we looking at what's happening to Black folks? If we really saw Black lives as equal to, as equal to ours, as worthy, why are we not more enraged? And so instead of demonizing Black anger and rage, what we should be doing is legitimizing that anger and rage. And you'll see this happen in classrooms. There's often moves to the adultification of Black students. There's, there's you know, always something that they should have done. And so instead of saying, you know, why is that Black student getting arrested? You'll hear many Brown folks saying, well, they shouldn't have resisted arrest. Or you'll, you'll, you'll hear, you know, Black children are expected to be polite and conforming in systems that erase their daily experience of violence and trauma. And speaking of this violence, there's also this notion of brown violence. In what ways do brown folks inflict violence on black folks? And you know, I share this, this, this next point as um, it's, a, it's a very personal point for me and it's something that I've been grappling with and thinking about and reflecting on deeply. When brown folks with links to African countries or Caribbean countries identify as African or Caribbean in particular spaces to gain credibility, um, without actually doing the work necessary to disrupt anti-Black racism, to take those risks, to stand in solidarity, this is a form of violence. And so we shift, we shift towards Blackness when it's cool, when it's woke, when it demonstrates some sort of street cred or street smarts, and then we switch right back to whiteness when we need to maintain our access or mobility within the system. We're chameleons, and it's just, it's, it's, I, and I've noticed this in me, and I've noticed this in my colleagues and friends, this way that we sort of switch back and forth depending on how it serves us. And then other forms of brown violence. We inflict violence on black communities in our claims to niceness, in our self-proclaimed kindness, in our apathy, in our silence, in our ignorance, in our refusal to critically self-reflect and learn. We inflict violence when we choose not to act. If we're in the staff room and we hear people saying those kids, those communities, those families, or we ourselves are saying those things. We inflict harm when we don't speak out because there's some perception that talking about anti-Black racism is high stakes. High stakes for whom? What we're essentially saying here is that we are willing to sacrifice Black children for our professional safety and promotion. Now that is a truth that we need to sit with. Then we think about this at the institutional level. And you know, there are many um, reforms that uh, all of us agree on that are necessary to move um, the agenda forward to support black students, families, and communities. We need intentional and targeted hiring in schools of education, in school boards, in higher education of critical black educators and scholars. We need our staffing, our funding, our policies, our structures, our curriculum, and our accountability measures to align uh, to structural transformations that center Black and Indigenous student excellence and well-being. Reforms that uh, all of us agree on that are necessary to move um, the agenda forward to students, families, and communities. We need the thanks. Um, then we think about uh, that we also need to uh, be anchored in community. We need to think about the fact that there are there are consequences to us not changing these disparities that need to be anchored in our responsibility to Black communities. But what we want to explore today very specifically is not what needs to be done in systems. That's a separate talk. What we want to talk about today is how do we as Brown folks subvert that important work. So the first thing that uh, we were talking about as a group is this idea of how we engage in relationships and uh, with, with 
black students and how we discipline black students. And we know that schools are microcosms of society. There are many of us as brown educators and leaders that engage in carceral logics of punishment, of criminalization, of dehumanization of black students in our discipline practices and our, our relationships with, with, excuse me, with students. I'm battling a cough, give me one moment. Thank you. The standard that we hold black children to is one of whiteness. And so while we as brown folks might aspire to whiteness, might be more accepted by, by, by whiteness, when we place that expectation on black students, that's a form of violence. And so if we are disproportionately putting black students out of class, sending them to the office, suspending them, policing their actions, not interrupting these patterns, not questioning our practices, handing out trespass notices to black parents, if we are not disrupting the disproportionate suspension and expulsion of black students, then we are upholding anti-black racism. And we can see how whiteness does this to us as brown folks. And in this strange sort of abusive situation, this cycle of violence that white supremacy perpetuates, we then turn and do the same to black students and families. We see this happening in, in our curriculum. Do we have high expectations for black students? And this is a legitimate question. Do we actually think that black students with the necessary supports can achieve? In what ways are we challenging a Eurocentric curriculum? In what ways are we centering culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy in every subject area, including math and science? And in what ways are we using CRRP as code for talking about equity work without actually centering Black realities, Black perspectives, Black excellence, Black histories, the African diaspora, as well as the ways that anti-Black racism plays out in schooling and society. Are we thinking intersectionally about Black Muslim students, about Black queer students, about Black folks with disabilities, about Black, about black women, about Black families living in poverty? And whose scholarship are we drawing on to inform our curriculum, to inform our learning, to inform our leadership, especially, and this is, this is the part that really gets me, is when we draw on white scholarship to address anti-Black racism. What? It happens also in hiring, retention, and promotion. And there are many of us brown folks that do not see, we actually don't see the brilliance of Black colleagues, far less name how anti-Black racism plays out in hiring decisions. Who is considered professional? Who is considered uh, capable? Who is deemed a leader? and we don't advocate for their hiring when we are in the position to do so. Also, if as brown folks, we're being tapped on the shoulder for leadership, or we're being groomed for leadership, or we, we're being promoted in some way, we have to ask ourselves, is it because we are complicit with whiteness? Is it because we are silent enough to maintain white power? Are we being hired because we are, are um, uh, you know, complicit enough to benefit from whiteness without actually disrupting the system? And I, I'm, I'm suggesting this to all of us. If you are hired as a brown person because you are white enough, that also means that you are intentionally anti-black. And I ask myself this question all the time, do I deserve my melanin? Do we deserve it? It operates in other systems and structures where we de-racialize initiatives. So you might hear brown folks saying things like, you know, arguing against the collection of identity-based data or suggesting that race should not be a factor in every decision making or saying that we complain too much you know if, if we complain too much that there's a focus on race and all in, of race in all of our professional learning spaces these are all attempts to decenter black and indigenous students then we think about our relationships with, with with black parents how do we as brown educators engage black students parents and communities you know we have seen far too often um, brown, parent, brown teachers, brown educators treating black parents as if they don't know, if they don't care about their children, if they don't care about education, assuming that all black families live in poverty. These are deep, deeply seated aspects of, of, of anti-blackness and brown consciousness that we need to divest from. You might hear brown, brown, brown teachers and white teachers saying things like, why are black parents yelling at me? Don't they know that I experience racism too? And not only, as both Juwan and Harveen have said, not only does this perpetuate the angry black parent narrative, we have to understand that anti-blackness is a historical and institutional issue, not an individual issue. And so black students and families have every right not to trust us as brown folks, because as a collective, we have not stood in solidarity to, to, to name and, and, and speak about the ways in which we are invested 
in white supremacy and whiteness. And because we are representatives of a school system, which brings with it a whole host of other reasons to mistrust us. And then we think about our relationships with the black community. And you know, this is one that I want us to think really st strongly about, especially if you are a leader in a school board. When it's time to turn to the black community for consultation, for decision making, for whatever it might be, which members of the black community uh, are we avoiding, actively avoiding, because we know that they're going to hold us to account? And which members of the black community are we actively welcoming because we know that they may not hold us to the same level of account? That is taking our internalized whiteness and imposing dividing conquer mentalities within black communities, pitting one against the other. To the teachers on this call, and as a former elementary school teacher, I'm asking myself this question, in what ways are we holding our unions and the Ontario College of Teachers accountable to addressing and disrupting anti-Black racism? There's a lot of talk of protecting teachers and a lot of talk of wanting to make sure that teachers' rights are in place. And I am in full support of that, we all are. But I also want to ask the question, in what ways are we protecting our jobs over the well-being and safety of Black students? And finally, this idea of brown people leading anti-Black racism work. Whew. We want to be really clear here that this session is not about us positioning ourselves as uh, folks leading this work. This session is about brown complicity and anti-Blackness. Anti-Black racism work needs to be led by critical Black folks with expertise and lived experience. But as brown folks, especially brown folks in positions of leadership, our role is to center Black and Indigenous students' success and well-being in every single decision, to allocate funds and resources accordingly, to listen, to be held accountable by the community. We are not suggesting for a moment that as brown folks, we sit back and we, you know, wait and we wait to sort of listen and, 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 and not act because we aren't Black. What we are suggesting is that we listen, that we believe the stories and the experiences, that we respect and that we take our lead from what Black students, families, communities, and staff have been saying for far too long. That we promote their voices instead of silencing them. That we leverage our Brown and positional power to support these changes. And so with all of that, we asked ourselves, so now what? What does this mean? What does this mean in terms of where we go from here? And this is where we are asking for a call to action. And this call to action is one that has three components. One is around critical self-reflection, one is around critical action, and one is around critical reflective praxis. And you know, we wanna name the fact that throughout history, there have been acts of solidarity between brown folks and black folks. There's the Black Panthers and the Dalit Panthers that had strong alliances. There's brown folks that marched um, and stood alongside and, supp and, and supported Black liberation movements in the US in the 60s and 70s, like my uncle who's on this call right now, um, and in, 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 a, in apartheid South Africa. Those strong coalitions between brown and black. And there have also been attempts to pit Asian and black communities against each other to distract us from the real cause of racism, which is white supremacy and the real solution to racism, which is building cross racial solidarities. And so we are in a place right now where we are asking yourself, now what? And again, we know that many uh, brown folks have been asking themselves now what for a long time and these calls to, calls to action are not new calls to action but what it is it's a way for us to come together as a collective of brown folks and say how are we going to move forward with this and so speaking about this notion of critical self-reflection we've been talking a lot about the need to make the personal political and the political personal and so to ask ourselves questions like how is my brownness complicit in white supremacy and anti-blackness or what have i lost from aligning to whiteness Praveen shared a lot of this with us, you know, the, the, the complexity of our, of our human experience where we're constantly toggling back and forth between model minority, perpetual outsider, model minority, perpetual outsider. What have we lost in our desire to align to whiteness? What have we gained from aligning to whiteness? Our access to safety, to wealth, to protection, to privilege, although there is a glass ceiling, of course. How do I challenge the meritocratic moves to equity within myself. And you know, this is one that I think is so important for us to talk about as brown folks. We have this undying loyalty to merit, to meritocracy, 
this careerism, this performism, and in what ways have we become meritocratic equity folks, folks that are going to do equity work the best, folks that are going to do anti-racist work the best, folks that are going to do anti-black racism work the best. Do we compete with each other? Because that's, a, that's, a, that's an element of meritocracy, right? It breeds competition. Are we competing with each other for these spaces without recognizing that the system is set up for very few of us to have these spaces? Are we complicit in the white supremacist ways of thinking and are we playing into them by pitting ourselves against one another? You know, we as presenters asked ourselves this question from, we have always been asking ourselves this question, but especially as we put this together, we've been asking ourselves this question. Are we doing this webinar for our own personal self gain and promotion? Or are we doing it in, sol in, 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 in solidarity, which requires that we actually take a risk? We have to remember that if what is driving us, if our, if our ultimate goal is to get ahead, to move up, then it becomes so easy to switch our tune and perform to whiteness when needed to get ahead or to move up. And one of the reasons we named this piece around uh, retweeting and hashtagging and all these different pieces around today's webinar is because we're intentionally trying to challenge and interrupt that pattern. You know, one of the things I think about often is do we choose our token black friend or colleague or a token indigenous colleague and simply just keep retweeting all of their tweets as a way of somehow performing solidarity to the outside world. And finally, we have to ask ourselves, who are our critical friends? What accountability measures do I have in place um, for my practice, for my leadership, for my learning? And we got a lot of comments from, from folks and the questions that came in to us about how do we have these conversations uh, with family and friends? And I want to say that if we are not talking about anti-Black racism with our family and friends because we are afraid of making people un uncomfortable, we're afraid that people will not think we're nice or sweet or kind, then we just need to be honest with ourselves about the fact that our relationships in Brown families, among Brown friends, are predicated on the preservation of anti-Blackness. There is no neutral. We are either supporting anti-Blackness with our silence or we are disrupting it with our actions. No amount of prayers or tweeting or likes or shares or sending love and light or good vibes or any of that is gonna change our complicity in that. So I'd like to turn it over to Herveen now. Thank you, Vidya. And in line with what you're saying, my focus is going to be on critical action. And so as we've been discussing and we're talking about how the white supremacy works and how it permeates within society, we've made it very clear that one of the key tactics that they use or white supremacy has built in its logic is divide and conquer. So our direct response to divide and conquer and the de-individualizing of our efforts in dismantling anti-Black racism has got to be a concerted effort that focuses on anti-black racism from a collective stance. As I was saying earlier, part of what we go through as brown people in aligning to whiteness and white supremacy is that we're constantly giving everything away. We give away our spirituality. We give away our ways of knowing. We give away our languages. We give away all of this and voluntarily at that, which actually bewilders me, um, and I don't know how to call people back in. And it's fine, you see this charism as, as Vidya and Jiwen were talking, we start climbing, 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 we get to a certain point. And then by the age, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, we start to see ourselves unravel and we start to unravel because there is a cost to aligning to white supremacy. There's an absolute human destru uh, uh, destruction that comes from constantly having to do that. We will never be equal to whites. And as long as we perform in that racial hierarchy, our uh, black people will also not, we will never be equal to black people. So we need to start to organize our, our efforts. As Brown collectives, I mean, we can write letters of support. We can hold us institutions accountable, including schools and school boards, uh, unions, of course, and the Ministry of Education. We need to call people in and hold them responsible. And here I wanna go uh, out on a limb and say that we also need perhaps an external institution to come in and see what's happening because the issues that we have in education today are not brand new issues. These are issues that are rooted generations upon generations upon gen I can go back 30 years ago and talk about issues of racism that have been in the board. So as much as we're talking about this today, 
and current events have brought us to, to this sense of urgency, this is not a new conversation. And this is what is so alarming and so frustrating and that we need to get our act together. In what ways are we as Brown educators demanding that school boards and the Ministry of Education, again, teacher unions, um, actually invest in uh, focusing on the ex ex expediting the hiring, re recruitment, sorry, the hiring, retention and promotion of critical black leaders into positions of power. This does not need to take a long time. You don't need to be tapped on the, on the shoulder. We've been trying to feed the pipeline for, I don't know, 30 years. It's not working. We need to investigate as to why it's not working. We must take collective action to uphold human rights of black and indigenous students. We first need to do the work ourselves and then think about reaching out to black colleagues and think about the ways in which we approach black colleagues to stand with them and take lead from them in the work that we do. We need to focus on coalition building between brown and black uh, folks, um, standing in front when they ask for the sake of protection, standing beside them when we speak to authority and standing behind them when we need to learn to humble ourselves and simply follow their lead. This is going back to what Vidya was saying. We cannot take the charge and lead anti-black uh, racism work. We need to take our lead from the critical black activists, teachers and principals and leaders that are probably already, most likely already within the system. Uh, we need to stop being a gatekeeper, which means that we need to stop being an informer to white power. We need to stop feeding white power information to maintain our position when it suits us. And then it's later used against black communities. So we secure our position by demonizing black educators or black colleagues so we can secure our job title. And in doing so, we are, we're doing it at the cost of black teachers, black leaders and our black students. We need to be mindful of being the token. And there are some people who are, you know, we, we can use that whole tokenistic position in our favor. And we need to really call ourselves out and call each other in when we're, in, we're doing that behavior. So we need to ask ourselves, in what ways is our equity work being used by white power to check off a box? In what ways is our physical presence being used to check off a diversity box? And we need to stop using the argument. I hear this over and over again. Herveen, I am just taking a calculated risk or I'm just navigating through the system. And I assure you, once I get to that position of power, I will start to do social justice and equity work in an outward manner. However, as we start to climb and we continue to climb, we are building mistrust, not only within our own community, but also mistrust with the black community. So we need to think very cr creatively and we need to think very deeply about what are we actually doing when we're saying we're just being uh, strategic. I'm just taking a calculated risk and navigating into in, in, in these white spaces. And also, lastly, we need to support the black community. We need to support black artists, black owned businesses. We need to support black liberation movements and not this stress free activism. We're talking about real activism. You post some articles, okay, you tweet some things, you put some stuff on Facebook. That's a baby step. It's one way. We need to continue to build on that and actually put the act in activism. We need to do more than we've been doing up until this point. Um, so what does this include? We need to stand alongside of the, the Toronto chapter or all chapters of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, Black education liberation movements. We need to read Black scholars. We need to listen and believe our Black students, our Black families and communities and educators do not add to their burden. This is not a time for us to go and tap on the shoulders of black people, black teachers and black communities and say, we're really sorry, now educate me. This is not a way to approach the issue. We need to do our own work. And I'll pass it off to Jeeva now. Sorry, thanks, Herveen. Um, uh, regarding the next point on critically reflective practice, um, or practice, there, there's mistrust between black and brown communities. and rightfully so. Words are not enough and um, we have to actually demonstrate our integrity. And so the, the question for me that I, you know that I keep coming back to is what are you willing to do? Um, we, we're, we're committed and involved in public education because we believe public education can actually create spaces for 
for all children, black, indigenous, and all children to be able to rise to their potential. But we're not going to be able to do that unless we address how we are complicit in this. And so I want brown folks to remember that we're not just, when we're trying to ascend, we're not just ascending on the backs of black people, we have our feet on their necks as well. And I, I say that really uh, intentionally for us to think about what is the cost of how we do the things that we do. And I want us to, to, to think about, as Herveen was saying, to stop putting the burden on black folks. We benefit from the labor, we do benefit from the, the activism, we benefit from the scholarship, and then we don't show up. So my question then is, is how are you going to show up? How are you going to make sure that black children are successful in your classrooms and in your schools? And how is that going to be non-negotiable in your practice? How is it that black parents are going to walk into your school and feel safe? How are you going to reposition the conversations? So when what, you, what is typically framed as black anger, you can understand just as it is in the safety for indigenous people, that schools have never been safe places for, for them. Um, and how are we actively interrupting those systemic realities that black children face in terms of achievement, in terms of well-being, in terms of safety? Um, we like to use you know, the jargon of growth mindset, self-regulation, grit, resiliency, student safety, student well-being. And uh, how are we empowering? All those things are riddled with ways that we silence black students. And, um, and so what we're hoping today is that these conversations and, and calls to action around our understanding our complicity and white supremacy, brown complicity and white supremacy and how that plays out and, um, and manifests anti-blackness, that we can begin and continue to build relationships of trust that are reciprocal, where we show up with integrity, um, and, and that we, we take action and that we are accountable and we're not scared to be accountable. We can change public education. It can work for black and indigenous students. We just need to mean it and, and create the alliances and the transparency and the accountability. It is possible. Um, and you know, just as an example, I've been uh, doing organizing work for about 20 years and this is the first time that within like it, we've advertised this for about what four days um, and had over 700 people sign up and I think that alone if we could harness that if we could show up imagine what that would look like when black people who continue to put themselves on the line when we show up with them in solidarity when in our schools we make sure that black children are not sacrificed that indigenous children are not sacrificed so that we could get ahead when we do that then then we can expect you know relationships of trust and solidarity but we really have to do it so really what does it mean for us to act collectively now and to keep pushing these conversations in the spaces that we're in. We, we can transform public education. Thank you. Ooh. Okay. Sorry, just bear with me for a moment. I'm trying to shift between learning over here and I'm uh, very over saturated with this amazing, amazing vault of knowledge you've all shared um, and, and switching to co-moderating here. Um, thank you so much, um, all of you, for all of that. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, so we are going to shift into the question and answer period at this point. Um, as you can imagine, we had a large number of questions. What we tried to do was really take those questions and break them down thematically. And um, I'm sure many of you will notice that um, the panelists were very responsive and addressed many of your questions in their speech itself, in their uh, talk itself. Um, however, we do have some lingering questions that we'd like to pose to the panel today. So the first uh, lingering question that we have here is, 
What are some of the barriers that drive the wedge between brown and black communities and how do we combat them? And I was thinking about what we've been talking through our conversation today is a focus on mistrust. Like we have, we have people who have been in the system for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And there comes a time where it's mistrust, it's been blaming, it's been shaming. And I think that as part of the work that we need to do as brown people is to identify where we've been wrong and be able to say that we've made a mistake. Up, you know, um, championing that program was at the cost of black students. When I enforced that policy, it was at the, black, uh, at the cost of black students. When I promoted this whole idea of shoulder tapping, the way in which we actually get leaders within certain systems, within um, certain school boards is absolutely abhorrent. Because if we're looking at changing the leadership mantle and we're looking at changing the leadership ethos, we need to change the way in which these folks are, are tapped on the shoulder and taken in and groomed for, for um, the actual pathway to leadership. We need to actually look at our teaching body and our leadership body. And not only does that leadership body need to, and teaching body need to be reflective of what's happening on the ground when we look at our student body, but we need critically conscious leaders in those positions. And so as a black community, as they're seeing that they're not having representation at any of those levels, we need to call attention as to why. And when we see other people being promoted all the way through, maybe it's because of the model minority, um, et cetera, and we see other brown folks rapidly going through the system, we need to call attention to that and say, but wait, there's a whole host of other people that haven't been tapped on the shoulder, haven't been mentored, haven't been brought into whatever these secret circles are to be promoted all the way through. And God forbid, you're in a position as a teacher and you might have a principal who doesn't have, who is not critically conscious, who could care less about anti-blackness um, issues within their school or anti-black racism. You have, you will have an almost impossible time of getting recruited and promoted all the way through that system. So I think we need to start identifying, calling things out and, and being able to say that this policy, this process is, is racist and I take responsibility for the way that I was um, I'm complicit in this system and how can I move forward and disrupt that? Um, thanks, Ravin. I think, I uh, apologize for the glitch there. I think the, you know, thinking about how, um, how it plays out in terms of when we think of, it's not just diversity isn't just the body, it's about the consciousness. And so we need to ask ourselves consistently, what is the work that we're doing on our own self criticality on our own consciousness? How are we making sure, like, you know, um, sometimes I get critiqued, for example, that I speak, you know, when I talk about or mention, you know, pieces connected to anti-Blackness, anti-Indigenous racism, why aren't you mentioning Islamophobia? So it's not that I'm not mentioning Islamophobia, but Islamophobia is a part of that spectrum that is built on anti-Blackness. And so, you know, it has dimensions, it has specific pieces, another, another talk for another time. The point is that we have to look for the ways that we're silencing, silencing the conversations. We do this in ways where we're like, well, everything is just about anti-Black racism. It's not about, you know, about what happens to us, us, quote unquote. And, and so in those ways, it keeps dividing us as opposed to the understanding that racism is built on anti-Blackness. You cannot solve racism without addressing anti-Blackness. White supremacy is upheld because it created anti-Blackness and it exists. And it's so melded into everything that we do, unless we're dealing with that, we will consistently keep perpetuating it, right? You know, um, really quickly as a, as a child, I grew up hearing that, you know, my brother is so nice and fair, um, but, you know, and then no one would say anything about me and you're like, well, what exactly does that mean, right? Um, and so understanding, and so, and I use myself as an example at the beginning in terms of the complexity of my intersecting identities, but the point is there is privilege in the way that my body is read. And so I have a different way that I'm able to navigate because of that privilege. And the question that I want us to think about is, how are you black educators, um, brown educators, sorry. How are you brown educators prioritizing your black students? How are you holding yourselves accountable? Instead of saying the problem is the black child, the problem is the black community, 
what is it that I need to shift in my practice because of these historical realities to change the outcome? And, and I think that is where we need to go because otherwise all we do is we keep upholding it. Great, amazing, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hey, Sultan here. All right, so we, with time permitting, we will um, advance to question three. How does brown complicity get reinforced in a culture of fear? And how do you, do, how do you disrupt that uh, inner feeling of silence? Is it okay if I start? Or Vidya, are you trying to talk? Sure, Harvey, but did you go ahead if you want? I'll, I'll jump in after. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about fear. What are we scared of? Our, what is actually going to happen? What is the actual risk of that we are taking in defending and standing for Black and Indigenous students? What are we actually going to lose? And I say that I mean, and I mean this very deeply and with all sincerity, because I hear this a lot, you know, Herbie, well, what about this? And I'm going to take a risk and then people are going to know me and then I'm going to be pigeonholed and then I won't get uh, promoted. I won't do all of these things, all of these things. And I ask them, sit down and start to label and identify exactly <clears throat> what's going to happen. And as you go through this piece of all of your fears, on the other side of the pay, pay, piece of paper, Write down exactly what Vidya and Jiwan had said earlier. Are, is the, all of your fears worth being at the cost of the well-being and academic excellence of Black students? What is the cost of your fear? So when you're asking me, well, how do you disrupt the inner feeling of silence? First, identify what exactly are you scared of? Is it, is it that you're scared of the promotion trap? Are you scared of the way you're gonna be perceived? Because no one's coming out to kill you, but we have seen that this is an actual lived reality that's happening within our black communities. So the privilege that we have as brown folks is to sit around and pontificate and actually think, well, you know, should I take this? Should I take this platform? Should I leverage my privilege and create space? What do I actually do? So identify what that fear is, is, is first and foremost. Go ahead, Vidya. Yeah, no, I was gonna share something similar. I think that, uh, I think we just need to be honest about, about what these fears are, like Herbie was saying. And if we are honest about the fact that what we are scared of is not moving up the ranks or not being accepted by other brown people or brown cultures or brown you know, racial identities that are wrapped up in anti-blackness, then we just need to admit that to ourselves. That's what the truth is. And that is at the expense of not just black excellence and black well-being, but but mm. black lives, frankly. Yes. And so we just need to, we just need to be really clear about that. And we need to at some point choose where our alliance is gonna be. And there just so I want to add to that, um, the whole piece that you had brought up earlier, Vidya, where you were talking about, well, what about the teacher unions? We have one of the strongest, if not uh, in Canada, if not the world, our teacher union is super strong. So how are we as teachers, if you're really scared that something's going to happen and you're going to be bullied, because I know there's issues of bullying within schools and I know there's significant you know, pockets in different places where it actually becomes psychological warfare. And I'm not disrespecting that and I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. It absolutely does exist. However, how many of these issues are noted and then taken to the teacher union? Because we have one of the strongest bodies. Why aren't we leveraging them in our favor? Uh, so this goes again, uh, towards, you know, we need collectivist movements. It's not just, you know, here's Herveen or there's Vidya and there's G1 having individual complaints. There needs to be a collectivist movement in addressing this. Um, one of the other things that I just want to acknowledge is um, in doing this work well, there are risks. So yes, you know, of course, we have to grapple with what is it? Is it we're scared to be promoted? Um, if that is it, or how we're seen by Brown and, and, and frankly, within a system. Um, there are risks. However, there are also a lot of people who um, have been addressing it. So there are strategic ways. And we have to look at how we do not allow the system to keep being complicit. Like, uh, quite honestly, it's exhausting. It's been, you know, for the last 40 or 50 years, if you try to look anywhere, any district of education to find somewhere where they have systemically erased 
uh, you know, unequal outcomes for Black, Indigenous, and you can go down the list of marginalized populations of students where they've been able to actually erase it. It has not happened. There's, this is not a research thing. There's 40 years of research. This is not an empathy thing because if people say they care, it would have changed. So we have to be honest in asking ourselves, why does it keep be, you know, happening? And what is our role in making sure it changes? And I think that is a largely a leadership piece, um, especially for us as senior leaders, and I'm holding myself accountable. How is it that we are beginning our conversation to say we cannot continue to do things the way they have been done, that is not okay to do this at the expense of Black and Indigenous children and, and margin, other marginalized groups of children, and, and, and begin by making sure the scholarship that we use and we turn to actually understands that. I mean, in Ontario, we're still going to, and, and no disrespect to their scholarship, but we're still going back to Fulan and Leithwood and Katz and the same you know, three or four white men that we keep perpetuating their work over and over and over when there are credible scholars. Everybody loves to talk about intersectionality. Nobody talks about Kimberly Crenshaw and the fact that black woman whose labor that we are benefiting from and, and, and scholarship. So we, there, has to, there has to be a moment and brown folks, we have to think about how we leverage our access and our privilege to say enough is enough. Our commitment to public education is for all children to be successful. And it's just as simple as that. Thank you, everyone. Um, as we closely approach 1.30, uh, this is actually drawing this webinar to a close. So uh, I would like to first and foremost thank our esteemed panelists for their insight, direction, and forthright honesty for a topic that requires a great deal of self-reflection and humility. So thank you, Vidya, Jiwan, and Harveen. Applauses, applauses. <laughs> Finally, to all of you, our co-learners, who are online with us now or even later. We hope this talk translates into immediate actions that position you alongside or behind our black brothers and sisters in humanity. Because honestly, at this point, your inaction is not an option and your complicity actively perpetuates anti-blackness and anti-black racism. This now concludes our webinar, Brown Complicity and White Supremacy Towards Solidarity with Black Lives. A recording of this webinar will be available uh, very soon and uh, we will be providing it or putting it onto our social media platforms. Thank you so much. Have a great day and a wonderful weekend to everybody. Well, Tan, just before you close, can I say one thing? Of course, please. I just wanted to um, also really acknowledge the work of Sultan Rana and Saima Chowdhury on this, on this webinar, um, and not just for the technical aspects of this that we would not have been able to do at all. That is, I think, quite clear to Jiwan Hervin and myself that we could not have done this. Um, but to thank you for not just the technical organizational pieces, but sharing your ideas and experiences yes. with helping us build the content of this. So thank you both so much. And thank you all for listening. Much love to everybody. Bye, everyone.